his feverish mind working ceaselessly together to observe and to analyze the physical world, and then to develop the ideas and designs which emerge from that process of observation. Leonardo is uh, ahead of his time in the notions which he dreams up. His flying machines, like the tank, are useless until there is an engine to propel them. But he is also the pioneer of new scientific principles. In his anatomical researches, as with Vesalius half a century later, observation takes precedence over theory and tradition. The draughtsmanship in Leonardo's notebooks and sketches would in itself rank him among the world's greatest artists. So would the quality of his surviving paintings, few though they are little remains of his two most ambitious projects, a large mural in Milan and another in Florence. The last supper in Santa Maria della Grazia in Milan has been so much restored because Leonardo used a new but defective technique that only its linear design is authentic. The scene of the victory at Angari for the council chamber in Florence was never completed and was subsequently painted over. I'm sure I pronounced that wrong. Only a few sketches survive, some of them showing skirmishes in the battle. Fumato and the Mona Lisa, 1505. Art historians can demonstrate the influence of both these works. Leonardo is a pioneer in his treatment of the human drama between Jesus and the Apostles at the Last Supper, and in his depiction of the movement in battle. But no expert guidance is required to appreciate Leonardo's panel paintings. They would introduce, or they introduce, a subtlety in the use of paint and in the treatment of light, which adds a new technique to the painter's repertoire. Leonardo gently blurs his colors one into another to avoid hard lines. The effect is known as smoky, or in Leonardo's words, without lines or borders in the manner of smoke. Leonardo's smoky style is seen in the portrait of a young woman which he paints in Florence in about 1505. She smiles at the viewer with her hands folded serenely on, the ed on a ledge in front of her. Her gaze is wonderfully mysterious, so is the dreamlike rocky background, so even is her identity. It is probable that the sitter is Lisa Giardini, the wife of Francesco del Giocondo. So the portrait is variously known now as La Gioconda, or the Mona Lisa from Mana, an old Italian word for lady. Mona. <laughs> Such hard words. She has been in France since 1517 when Francis I makes the elderly Leonardo as court painter and takes Mona Lisa into the royal collection. Michelangelo the sculptor.
authorities want a marble statue of David. Michelangelo using a vast slab of marble, abandoned by a another sculptor, presents the biblical hero, more than twice life-size, about thirteen feet high, as a naked youth is standing with petulant confidence, sling thrown over his shoulder before the encounter with Goliath. Michelangelo works on David from September 1501 until January 1504. In 1505, the Pope, Julius II, summons him to Rome with a commission to provide a sculpted tomb with many figures for the Pope's own memorial. The vast project hangs over Michelangelo for the next four decades. Some of his best-known works are later carved to form part of it. The Great Marble Moses and the Two Tormented Slaves of 1513 through 6, or through 16, but the project is doomed to remain unfinished. Part of the reason is that Julius II has an even more challenging task for this multi-talented artist. In 1508, he commissions Michelangelo to paint the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. Michelangelo the Painter, 1504 through 1550. Michelangelo's reputation as a painter derives almost entirely from his work in one building, the Sistine Chapel. A few panel paintings possibly survive from his hand from the period 1495 through 1508, though only one of them is accepted by scholars beyond any doubt. This is the circular virgin and child commissioned by Angelo Doni in about 1504, now in the Uffizi, or Uffizi, Two panel paintings in the Na National Gallery in London have long been attributed to Michelangelo by some and rejected by others. At the end of his life, there are frescoes for another Vatican building, the Pauline Chapel, with Michelangelo completes in 1550, but all the rest of his paintings is done in two creative bursts on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, 1508 through 12 and on the wall above the altar, 1536 through 41. Michelangelo's concept for the ceiling of the chapel is bold as his execution of the figures. An elaborate architectural perspective draws the eye up past alcoves, in which huge figures sit to ever-receding panels, which eventually display a series of narrative scenes. These vast but distant seeming panels along the center of the ceiling, each about 10 by, 15 by 18 feet, tell the story at the start of Genesis, from God's creation of the universe to the f famous spark of life, from the Creator's finger to the languid Adam to the languid Adam, and on through the expo expulsion from Eden the more conventional form of human, frailty in the drunkenness, drunkenness of Noah. The attendant figures, many of them cramped in the available spaces, twist and turn with convincing flexibility. They seem to have a muscular certainty, even where distortion is involved, deriving from Michelangelo's skill as a sculptor. The colors revealed a fresh and a cleaning program during the 1990s, are vibrantly bright in often startling combinations. With these surprises of posture and color, Michelangelo inspires a younger generation to develop the style known as mannerism. The effect of the Sistine ceiling is exuberant, optimistic. It fits with the, confident, the confidence of Julius II the end wall of the chapel is very different, but it too reflects its times. 
In 1527, Rome is sacked by an unruly army of German mercenaries, while Clement the F the uh, seventh shelters helplessly, or er, sixth, helplessly in the cast Castel Saint er, Saint Angelo. In the aftermath of this appalling event, Clement commissions Michelangelo to paint the end wall of the Sistine Chapel. The subject is to be the Last Judgment. Again, Michelangelo captures the mood perfectly, giving this traditional, cautionary tale a dark and dramatic violence, though the anguished nudity proves too much for some. Twenty years later, Daniel Del Volterra is employed to paint in some loincloths. From the creation to the Last Judgment, the Sistine Chapel forms a single masterpiece, Giotto's chapel is Padua. In Padua is the only other building to express so thoroughly one painter's vision. Michelangelo the architect and poet, 1520 through 1564. From the 1520s, when Michelangelo is indisputably Italy's greatest artist, Leonardo and Raphael have died in 1519 and 1520. He is frequently commissioned to provide architecture as well as sculpture and painting. His first major architectural project in Florence is a commemor commemorative chapel for the Medici family. Michelangelo designs it from 1520 providing both the architectural setting and sculptures for the tombs. The full scheme is never completed, for the chapel contains only two tombs, on which recline the famous pairs of allegorical figures, day and night, dawn and dusk. Another commission begun in Florence a few years later is the Laurentian Library, or Bibliotheca Medica um, Medi Medicia Lorenziana. In Rome, in the 1530s, Michelangelo designed the buildings on the capital. Together with the steps leading up to them, much as they are today, in the center of the, pia of the piazza of the capital, he builds a plinth and moves on to it the magnificent equestrian statue from Roman times of the Emperor Marcus Aurelius. The final architectural commission of Michelangelo's long life comes in 1546. Much against his will, he is put in charge of the new St. Peter's. With a sure touch, he simplifies the project, bringing it back towards Bramant's original conception. The great drum supporting the dome is completed to his own design before his death in 1564. From his early days in Florence, when his talent is encouraged by Lorenzo di Medici, Michelangelo also takes a keen interest in literature and philosophy. About 250 of his poems survive. A few are madrigals, others are religious, but the majority are sonnets, written with platonic passion to a female poet, Vittoria Colana, and a young boy, Tommaso di Cavalieri, published first in a bout bautlerized form in 1623. They only become fully known and appreciated after an edition of 1863. They have subsequently won Michelangelo a reputation among Italy's leading poets to add to his other distinctions. Raphael, 1504 through 1520. While Michelangelo is painting the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, Raphael is junior by eight years, is working on another commission from Julius II, just a few hundred yards away. Raphael may be described as the boy wonder of the Italian Renaissance.
born in Ur Urbino in 1483, the son of a minor painter, Giovanni Santi. Raphael makes his way in about 1504 to Florence. Over the next few years, he paints the serenely beautiful Madonnas and holy families set in luxuriant landscapes, which first reveal his genius. The style derives from Perugino, Perugino in whose studio Raphael probably learned his craft. But in these paintings, there is a new certainty of composition, modeling, and color. News of his talent must have spread rapidly among the patrons of the day, because towards the end of 1508, he is summoned to Rome and is given a papal commission of great importance. Julius II wants frescoes for a series of rooms in the Vatican, which he intends to use as his own apartment. This sensitive task is entrusted in 1509 to the 26-year-old Raphael. It occupies him for the rest of his life. Raphael's astonishing achievement in the stanze, Italian for Rome's, and the simple name by which they are still known, is a triumph over many different problems, all new to him when he begins. The themes to be de depicted for the Pope are often intellectual and thematic, and thus much harder to bring to life than the intimacy of the Holy Family. They involve large numbers of characters, requiring compositional skills similar to those of a director, presenting a scene on a stage, and the vaulted rooms with walls interrupted by doors or alcoves pre present irregular and difficult surfaces. Raphael triumphs over these obstacles. In the very first room, which he undertakes, the Stanza della Segnatura, he creates with great confidence two crowded and contrasted scenes the School of Athens, featuring Plato, Aristotle, and many others, and the Disputa, in which biblical fig figures and saints discuss the Christian sacrament. Raphael's work on the stanza is interrupted by, from 1515 by another important papal commission. Pope Leo X, elected in 1513, wants a set of ten tapestries to hang around the lower walls of the Sistine Chapel. He asks Raphael to design ten scenes from the New Testament to be sent north to Europe's best weavers in Brussels. Raphael, by now a master of large narrative compositions, paints the scenes as full-size cartoons on paper. In spite of hazardous journeys to Brussels and back to Rome, and then to England in 1623, after being bought for Charles I's tapestry factory in Mortlake, seven of these cartoons survive in surprisingly good condition in the Victoria and Albert Museum. During these same years, Raphael has been developing formidable skills as a male portraitist, painting his subjects more informally than it has been in the tradition. With a soft play of light on fabric and flesh, usually against neutral backgrounds to focus all attention on the man's character, his sitters include both his papal patrons, Julius II and Leo X, and his friend the writer Baldassare Castiglione. The brilliant portrait of Castiglione, with its muted range of blacks and grays and browns, is the perfect example of this new style. It is a style which will be developed with great flair during the 16th century by the portrait painters of Venice, in particular, Titan. When Raphael is painting Castiglione's portrait, in 1515, Michelangelo has re recently finished the Sistine ceiling, 
and Leonardo da Vinci is also in Rome, not painting, but busy with scientific experiments. A mere six years after beginning the stanze, Raphael is as much admired as the two older men. He has a thriving studio with a great number of assistants. He has been appointed architect of St. Peter's in 1514 and is busy with other architectural projects. These three artists are already seen as the outstanding figures of the time, a period subsequently regarded as the High Renaissance in Florence and Rome. Five years later, after a brief illness in 1520, Raphael dies. He is 37. His career has spanned just 16 years. Venetian painting, 1475 through 1576. During the 15th century, the great formative period of the Italian Renaissance, Venice lags far behind Florence and Rome in responding to the spirit of the time. The reason is partly the long centuries of Byzantine influence. Venetian patrons still expect a painting to be an object of solemn form formality, preferably against a gilded background in the tradition of icons. It is also true to say that in architecture at this same period, the Venetians are enjoying a magnificent late flowering of the earlier Gothic tradition. The mood of the Renaissance has less immediate appeal gear, but in terms of painting, this changes rapidly after 1475. In 1475, a Sicilian painter, Antonello da Massini, arrives in Venice where he spends about 18 months. He is expert in the northern technique of oil painting, and the rich glowing quality of his work greatly impresses Venice's leading painter, Giovanni Bellini. After Antonello's visit, the figures in Bellini's paintings evolve towards the rounded and richly human style of the Italian High Renaissance. The grouping of the figures in his altarpieces becomes solidly three-dimensional. His virgins sit at ease with their infants in enchantingly natural landscapes. His portraits are of flesh and a blood people, even in their Sunday best. In the last years of Bellini's long life, there are two young painters in Venice capable of more than equaling his genius. They add to the Venetian palette the richness of color which becomes the outstanding characteristic of the school. The first of the two is Giorgione. He dies young in 1510, though only two or three years younger than Raphael, and his work is only known from a very small number of richly glowing masterpieces. The second is Tite Titian, whose life is as long as Giorgione's is short. Titian establishes a dominant position in northern Italian painting equal to that of Leonardo, Michelangelo, and Raphael in Florence and Rome. Like any other good painter of the time, Titian receives commissions for church altarpieces, but he also produces large secular paintings for delivery to an impressive clientele of princely customers. The first such patron is Alfonso di Este of Ferrara, for whom Titian paints three magnificent classical subjects between 1517 and 1523, one of them Bacchus and Age Arid. Aridney, Aridney, something like that, is today one of the treasures of the National Gallery in London. Titian's customers, customers also include the two great rivals of the era, Francis I of France and the Emperor Charles IV, or V, sorry. He has no need to enter their service abroad. 
he dispatches works to them of, from his studio in Venice. Charles V and his son Philip II become Titian's most persistent patrons. They particularly like his mythological subjects. Mytho mythology provides many opportunities to display the naked female form, and these paintings build upon a rich new tradition in Western art. Botticelli has pioneered the theme of the nude, but Giorgione and the Titian develop, and then Titian develop it seductively in the art of Venice. Titian also has an extremely busy career as a portrait painter, particularly in the 1530s and 1540s. During his long life, into his mid-80s, he paints in an increasingly free style, until his brush strokes become bold shortcuts to the depiction of reality. A similar freedom of execution is characteristic of Tintoretti, or Tintoretto, the next of Venice's great masters, Veronese, arriving from Verona, in 1555 completes the trio, who together give the Venetian school such distinction. Veronese paints his vast canvases in a more measured and controlled style than Titian or Tintoretto, but the richness and color remain unmistakable, as with so many other painters in the studios of Venice at this time. In 1494, a young German artist trained originally by his father as a goldsmith arrives in Venice to improve his skills as a painter. The following year, he returns to Nuremberg to open a studio in his hometown, but in 1505 he is back in Venice, staying 18 months to savor the artistic delights of this city. He is impressed above all by the aged Bellini. The young man is Albrecht Durer, I think that's how it's pronounced, Durer, who becomes the outstanding figure in Renaissance Germany. His achievement is enhanced by his originality in many differing fields of art. An early example is his extraordinary self-portrait at the age of 22. A young man with disheveled blonde hair wearing exotic red headgear and lavish robes stares moodily from the canvas. It is the first example in history of an artist presenting himself as an eye-catching figure of dramatic interest. Renaissance painters in Italy have sometimes inserted themselves as bystanders in a crowded scene, but Durer takes center stage beginning a long romantic tradition of the self-portrait, carried by Rembrandt to its greatest lengths. Five years later, Durer paints himself in even more splendid clothes, with a view of the Alps through, his, through a window. Here, he says, is a man who has traveled to Italy. Durer's two trips to Italy result in other work of great originality, as he travels, he sketches in watercolor the features of the landscape which take his fancy. Trees by a lake, a castle on a hill, mountain valleys. These watercolors are not preparatory work for oil paintings. They are done, it seems purely for pleasure, beginning a rich tradition in the story of art. Durer's astonishing skill in the medium is evident in his famous 1502 sketch of a hare. He breaks new ground, yet again traveling to Antwerp in 1520 when he keeps the first example of a journal illustrated with sketches. Meanwhile, he makes himself the most prolific Renaissance master in the new printmaking techniques of woodcut engraving and etching. The first artist prints 15th through 16th century 
when the first European prints are published in the early 15th century, they are the work of craftsmen supplying a demand for cheap holy images or, the play or f for playing cards. Artists only become interested in the possibilities of the medium from the 1450s. They are first attracted by the newest technique at the time, intaglio, engraving in copper. The pioneer in the field is extremely prolific, creating more than 300 engraved plates, but he is known only as Master E.S. from the two initials, with which he sometimes signs his plates. The first two known artists to specialize in engraving began work at the same period, the 1460s, but in different places, Montagna in Mantua and Mantua and so Scone Gower in Colmar. The greatest printmaker among Renaissance artists is like Scone Gower, a German, but unlike his predecessors, he excels in woodcutting and etching as well as engraving. Albrecht Durer, familiar with metal from his early training as a goldsmith, begins engraving copper plates in his twenties and rapidly develops a mastery of the technique. He is more unusual in tackling at the same period. The 1490s, the much more mechanical craft of the woodcut, but Durer's large and completely assured woodcuts immediately demonstrate that this too can be an artist's medium. The third form of printing in which Durer shows his originality is etching. This is a technique invented during his lifetime. The first etchings are printed, probably in Aus Augsburg, in about 1500 from iron plates at this stage rather than copper. Durer first tries the new medium in 1515. He only etches six plates, but he is the first to demonstrate the informality of etching, which can give the artist almost the same freedom as sketching in pencil. From the end of the 16th century, etching is virtually the only form of printing to attract the artist until the arrival of the aquatint and lithography. Later masters, such as Rembrandt, develop the potential first shown by Durer. And that is all we have for today. I hope you enjoyed this little mini-series of the Ren history of the Renaissance. Next Facts Friday will probably be one of the old-style Facts Friday videos where I'm just going to be doing facts in a list like one, two, three, four. Um... I really hope you enjoyed this, and I will see you again on Monday. Um, have a great weekend, and be safe. Good night.